Jalen and I'm here today with another writing video. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about writing narrative summary. So in a video from maybe around a month ago, um, I talked about scene and how to write an effective scene and talked about how we can kind of split narrative into two types, narrative scene and narrative summary. And that video was about scene and in it I'd said that narrative summary would be a different video. So that's what we're going to be covering today. So while scenes play out an active moment, that is rooted in a specific period in time. Summary is detached from a specific moment on the timeline and is instead rooted in the character's internal world. So it can be used to condense long periods of time, kind of skim over the timeline, kind of create a montage-like effect, it can be used to convey backstory or information, or just dive into a character's thoughts. Scene is rooted in an active moment of the story, where in summary we lift above the story, kind of looking at it from more of a bird's eye view. Books with longer timelines relative to their length usually need more narrative summaries. A 300 page book that covers 15 years is probably going to need more narrative summary than a 300 page book that covers four days. So there is no set ratio that your book needs to hit in terms of how much scene versus summary there is, but typically if you're writing for a younger audience, there should be more active scene and less narrative summary. Even a book that with a short timeline for a middle grade audience is probably still going to utilize some narrative summary. And so no matter where your book falls on any of these spectrums, narrative summary is a really crucial tool. And it's not something to be afraid of. While too much narrative summary can slow the pace or make it feel like nothing is happening, narrative summary is still a critical aspect of storytelling, and so the key isn't to avoid it, but just to learn how to use it appropriately and effectively. So when should you use narrative summary? So while we use scene for an active moment where the plot is progressing, we can use narrative summary to condense periods of time where the character isn't actively moving the plot forward. In this case, it's actually a lot more efficient and engaging to use narrative summary. If we had a bunch of scenes depicting all these moments where the character wasn't really doing anything active or interesting or the plot wasn't really moving forward, it would actually start to get really dull to wade through. But if we condense it into an effective and efficient piece of narrative summary, it can actually become quite engaging if delivered well. Narrative summary can be used to show routines or habits that happen over a long period of time. You can use it to kind of skim over time and just pick out very brief, important little moments, kind of like in a montage. You can use it to supplement the story with exposition, backstory, or monologue, or use it for emotional or psychological reaction. Sometimes an author will make the decision to use summary for an active moment. As always, just make these choices with intention and purpose. If you're like, I can only achieve the effect I want with this active scene if I actually tell it from narrative summary, then that's totally fine. As a general guideline, we use scene for active moments and uh, summary for passive moments. You may still have passive scene or active summary. That can still happen. It's just like general rule. As well, scene and summary can blur together. You can use a passage of narrative summary to uh, lead into a scene, to bridge scenes together, or to exit out of a scene. The reader probably won't even consciously log that switch from summary to scene, but a lot of the time we use narrative summary as kind of the glue between scenes. Summary might also be embedded within or braided throughout a scene. Or in some cases, a section of summary can stand on its own. This is all to say that narrative summary is a very flexible tool. You have the bricks, which is all the scene, and the narrative summary is the mortar that kind of sinks between it all and glues the whole story together, glues all those scenes together. One of the most important concepts for writing narrative summary well is psychic distance. Psychic distance is how close the narrative is to the protagonist, and by extension, how close the reader will feel to the character. Psychic distance can fluctuate across a piece, but we want these fluctuations to feel seamless and be in line with the piece's general limit. So this is a paragraph where each sentence, the psychic distance gets closer. It is 2023 and a grocery store clerk, clerk is walking home from work. He stops to play with a stray dog. The dog jumps into his arms and reminds him of his childhood dog, Rufus. The dog's nail scratches his leg and he ruffles its fluffy ears. What a cute little guy. So we begin with an objective fact. It is 2023. That is just the year the story is taking place. Um, and we're viewing the character very objectively. You can get these closer details. We get a memory, we get sensory detail, it starts to get closer, more immediate, and then finally we get a thought. What a cute little guy. I have a whole 
but very old video on psychic distance. So if you want to learn more about psychic distance and the things that can affect it, I will leave a link to that. That leads us to the concept of free indirect narration. This is basically just very close third person. Free indirect narration is when the thoughts of the narrator and the character blend together seamlessly, creating just one single unified voice. There are no italics, filters, uh, quotation marks, or anything separating thought from the narrative voice because the thought is the narrative voice. This is usually used to refer to a third person narrative where it's very close. So the third person narrator takes on the qualities of the protagonist. There's no separation between narrator and protagonist, even though it's in third person. So the alternative to something like free and direct would be direct using quotes or italics to offset the thoughts or indirect, which would be using filters. So filters would be to use the words like she thought. Both are shown in the following example. I'm hungry, Penelope thought. Maybe I'll order a pizza. She went to dial but couldn't find the phone number normally pinned to the fridge and then realized she couldn't find her phone either had someone broken in and stolen it. We have thoughts presented both directly and um, indirectly th separated through italics and through a filter, Pen Penelope thought. So this is a further psychic distance. There's separation between narrator and character because we're distinguishing what is Penelope's thoughts versus what is the narrative voice. So this is that same paragraph written in free indirect narration. Penelope was hungry. Maybe she'd order a pizza. She went to dial but couldn't find the phone number normally pinned to the fridge. She couldn't find her phone either. Had someone broken in and stolen it. We can imagine this same paragraph essentially in first person with no changes. I was hungry. Maybe I'd order a pizza. I went to dial but couldn't find the phone number normally pinned to the fridge. I couldn't find my phone either. Had someone broken in and stolen it. So if you're writing narrative summary, it's really helpful to have a strong understanding of psychic distance. And if you want to have a close psychic distance, how to use free indirect narration. It's not necessarily right for every story. If you're trying to create a close third person voice, this is a really important concept to understand. And in terms of writing narrative summary, where we're going to be having probably a lot of thoughts, emotion, reflection, we're zoomed out from the story. This is a really important concept to understand. When the narrative summary becomes very distant, um, especially compared to the scene, if you have really close scenes, but very distant narrative summary, then the narrative summary really starts to feel like telling. If you can write narrative summary that feels as close, psychically close as an active scene, then the narrative summary won't be as jarring and will fit much more seamlessly into the narrative. This is often more intuitive in first person. These same concepts apply to first person, but free and direct narration is usually just like a third person term. Let's just go into some tips for writing effective summary. So tip number one, use voice, tone, and emotion. Implementing these things into narrative summary can make them feel immersive just in the way that a scene would. If your summary is really flat, like it doesn't really have any voice, it doesn't really have any emotional or tonal quality, then again, it's going to feel very distant. It's going to feel very flat. We want our narrative summary to feel as exciting as scene. And one way to do that is to be utilizing voice just as carefully as you would in an active moment. Step number two, building off what I was just saying, keep the psychic distance close. I'm going to make a blanket statement here and say that in the majority of stories, close psychic distance is more effective. There are obviously exceptions. And if you are making an informed choice, write a more distant third person if there's a reason for that. But in most cases, we are aiming to have a closer psychic distance because it's more immersive. It's more immediate. We feel closer to the character. We can connect better to the characters. We can invest better in the story, the narrative is more seamless. You know, not every story is as psychically close as possible. Like the closest psychic distance possible would be like a stream of consciousness. So usually we're not writing, even in a closer POV, we're not in like the closest perspective possible. A really common mistake, like one of the most common, more amateur mistakes is that the psychic distance is too far and it's not being done intentionally. It's really important to learn how to write a close POV and how to control the distance of the POV and write your narrative summary and your entire work with control. So yeah, you're not necessarily always in the closest psychic distance possible, but typically a closer POV is more immersive and is easier to connect to. What you really don't want is for your narrative summary to feel really distant compared to your active scene. Tip number three is to be specific. Even in summary, convey specific and interesting information that enriches the story. Just because we're summarizing doesn't mean we want to be vague. We still want to be specific in summary because that's what makes the summary feel alive and bright and compelling. Let's say you're summarizing what two characters did over one summer. You were like, we spent the summer hanging out and doing lots of fun things. 
Uh, we went to lots of restaurants and some cool events and we had a good time. This is really, really vague. I have no sense of what these characters did. Like, what specifically did they do? What events did they go to? What fun things did they do? We dipped into the specifics of what they did and peppered this narrative summary with bright, compelling little details. Then it can actually be really, really interesting. And on that note, number four, don't be scared of information. I've talked about this in a lot of videos because it's really common for writers to be scared of information. And I went through a phase where I was really scared of information and it, it comes from these ideas that are not very good advice, which is basically that exposition and telling are bad, and they're not bad. It just takes some finesse to learn how to use telling and learn how to use exposition skillfully. Narrative summary is often where we are conveying a lot of information. Stories are just made up of pieces of information, and so we don't have to be afraid of information because that's what a story is. A story is information about the character's world, conflict. If you have information that you want to share with the reader, share it. Tip number five, access emotions and opinions. As you're using narrative summary, maybe to condense time, maybe to convey information, one way to keep it feeling psychically close and psychologically interesting is to really access the character's emotions and opinions. If you're writing exposition and you're writing information and you're using it with voice and you're imbuing it with emotion, it can be really engaging. But if you're just telling information in a very dry way where you're not really leaning into the voice, you're not really leaning into the emotion, your character doesn't really have any opinions on anything, it can start to feel really dry. What does your character feel? What are their opinions on what is happening? Narrative summary is a great place to explore those things and actually increase the emotional richness of your story. So don't be afraid to lean into emotion. Don't be afraid for the character to unpack their emotion. Opinion, tone, voice, emotion are really great tools for making narrative summary feel just as engaging as same. Number six, summary can and should still have conflict, stakes, tension, goals, etc. The character may not be pursuing a single specific goal in the moment, because there isn't a specific moment, but they still have goals for the overall story. They still have desires. There's still overall like forces of conflict and tension at play. Forces of narrative fuel, they don't disappear when we move from scene to summary. They're still present. And don't forget about how they're making your character feel and act and experience the world. Summary is still part of the character's life. Just because we're not telling a single specific moment that maybe moves the story forward in a really clear, tangible way, like a scene would, Summary is still part of the story's development. It is still part of the character's life. Tip number eight, I would understand the summary's relationship to time. It's usually seen as a specific moment in time, summary plays with time much more loosely. We can be you know, more playful with how we engage with time. We can be kind of completely lifted away from timeline, very bird's eye view. We can cover very long periods of time. We can look at kind of cyclical time. Like summary is a really great place to play with time because while the active scenes are typically gonna be moving forward in usually chronological order, not always, but usually chronological order, unless you have a nonlinear narrative, summary isn't really bound by the laws of linear time because it's within the character's thoughts and mind. What is the temporal relationship that this bit of summary has to the story? And don't be afraid to make this clear. If the summary is narrating what happens over the next few months, it's okay. In fact, I would encourage you to use the words over the next few months. Chronology tags are a really useful tool for orienting the reader in time, are just as important, or even maybe sometimes more important, to use with summary than within scene. Because often within scene, it's a bit more obvious that this is the next temporal step forward in the plot. But with summary, that's not always as obvious. So don't be afraid of chronology text. Tip number seven is to use showing and telling. Summary isn't just a huge block of telling. If it was just a huge block of telling, it could get pretty dry pretty quickly. Learning to show in summary is a really important skill. If, if it's just split up, I show through scene and I tell through summary, again, the summary will start to feel really dry. Use both tools in both types of narrative. You're typically in summary doing one of two things. You're either compressing or you're expanding. You're taking a very small moment and you're expanding, really zooming into the thoughts, reflections, mono, that's like a monologue, right? Where it may zoom very close and expand a very specific moment of time. You can think of it, it's like lift, right? You're lifting above the story in order to really get deep reflection. 
or you're compressing, you're taking a larger period of time and you're compressing it in a way where we can get an overview of this larger section of time in a shorter period of space. That's what it is often, it's compression. And within that compression, we can still show. Along with that, don't be afraid to use dialogue. Dialogue is not reserved for scene. A lot of the time in narrative summary, you may have one just like more like standalone lines of dialogue. So rather than a full conversation with a back and forth, because that would be more of a scene, we can just have lines of dialogue embedded in narrative summary. If there was something compelling that someone says in one of the moments that we're kind of skimming through in this you know, compression type of montage, we can actually still have that line. We can use all the same components of narrative that we had in scene in summary. The next tip is to use summary to unpack the ideas that are being laid in scene. The scene is how we're actively expressing that theme how we're seeing that theme enacted on the characters, how the characters are enacting the theme in a lot of cases. But in summary, you can then unpack ideas that are being presented in the scene. Summary is where the main character can reflect and you can actually have some more overt, but also in a way nuanced discussions around the themes and ideas in your story. If you're leaving all the thematic work just to summary, it's gonna feel really flat. It's gonna just feel like kind of monologuing theme when the work isn't actually being done on the page. If you're using the summary to unpack the ideas and the thematic groundwork that's being laid and expressed through scene, you can get a lot more richness out of the themes and ideas in your story. And the final tip is to use sentence structure to control the pace. Summary still has pace. You can control that through the sentence structure and the sentence rhythms. That's creating a rhythm to the narrative summary rather than it being in a, an active scene where we kind of have like beats that we're moving through. It's really just language based. So I'd really think about sentence structure here, especially summary. If you like myself, if you're a big language guy and you love prose and you love musicality of it, this is where you can really indulge in that. So I want to jump into an example now. Um, so this is an example from All This Could Be Different by Sarah Thenka Matthews. And um, this is just the prologue. So this is a prologue that is primarily narrative summary, though it does occasionally kind of dip closer to scene. You can kind of see how it can almost be more of a spectrum. Matthews is really excellent excellent at using tone, rhythm, and specificity to make the summary feel just as alive as a scene would. I would like to tell a story of a different time. I was 22, a teak switch of a girl. I had finished college. There were not many jobs. The economy had punctured like a tire. Obama had won a second term. He said jobs, healthcare, national healing. He said Trayvon Martin could have been my son. I was moved by this, thought that sort of imaginative exercise bravery. I would listen to his speeches on NPR as I dressed for work. I had found a job. This set me apart from my college friends. I was a consultant, or going to be. This despite my arty degree. A consultant in training. Three toddlers hiding in a suit. I did not consider myself a sellout. What I felt was that I had been saved from drowning. My classmates without jobs had moved in with their parents, were working unpaid internships at noble nonprofits. I wished them well. My parents were not with me, had left me to make my way in a new country. I was glad they did not, for now, need me to send them money. They had before. My client was a baobab of a corporation, Fortune 500. They made car seats, heating units, pedometers, batteries. My boss demanded I wear pantyhose. You were a contractor, he told me, no benefits. Women who work for me wear makeup. That is how it is. My men wear suits. You must dress better than the clients, always. This is how they know we work for them. We get the clients to their definition of success. People only want to hire a guy when they want to be him a little. Remember that. Try some makeup, just a little, nothing tardy. I listened dutifully. The pay was only okay. Billable contractors' wages, this despite the 50-hour weeks. I had to file self-employment taxes. But my boss liked me. Early on, he called me his rock star. This was funny to me, since in actuality, rockers get on stage, perform, fuck many girls, wreck the hotel room. I, meanwhile, sweated competence. A hungry efficiency. Waxed my arms. Radiated deference. Never met a Gantt chart I didn't like. He had first offered me $19 an hour. His firm was tiny, only nine people. I said, thank you, I will think on it. I walked to a good restaurant in my college town and drank a full glass of white wine in the middle of the afternoon. I called him back. I said, hello, Peter. I have another offer, but I want to work with you. Would you consider 30? In the space between the gin bottles, the mirrored bar showed me a soft-featured girl, skin the color of Hennessy, eyes vacant with fear. My boss said, like a god granting a boon, 23 an hour. You'll relocate to Milwaukee, where your client is. I will pay for your apartment. That sounds great, I said, may have added. I'm honored to get to work for you. All nonsense. Once I hung up, I punched the air and yelled. I remember the restaurant as deserted, but it may not have been. This is not a story about work or precarity. I am trying late in the evening to say something about love, 
which for many of us is not separable from the other shit. As the summer began, I moved to Milwaukee, a rusted city where I had nobody, parents two oceans away. I lay on the sun-worn wood floor of my paid-for apartment and decided I would be a slut. Um, you can see how it's not set in a specific moment. Mostly getting told how she ended up in the place where she is at the start of the book, which is moving to Milwaukee for a new job. But it's, it's disengaged from a single moment in time. She's narrating, she's summarizing what happened. We get closer to scene as she gives the specifics of how she got the job, where she was, even some dialogue. Um, so there it's flitting closer to being a scene, but this, these tiny moments of more active moments are embedded within summary. It's not even linear, right? Like she's telling all about who her client is before she talks about how she got the job and relocated. So it's not linear. We're disengaged from a specific moment of linear time. She does a great job of implementing stakes and conflict through narrative summary, even right at the beginning. I had finished college, there were not many jobs. We get some internal conflict, she refers to, and voice, she refers to herself as three toddlers hiding in a suit. There's a great sense of voice, motion, and, you know, conflict and stakes. So I think this is a great example of effective narrative summary. I wanted to run through just some really short examples from my own work, just so I can talk through my own process. So this is from the first chapter of my novel currently on submission, Honey Vinegar. Many nights I stayed at the farmhouse. In those long blue summer evenings, sometimes Jack would stay late, Teresa would join us, and the four of us would play a hand of euchre. I could imagine that things were still the way they'd been before my mother and Freya had arrived. Silas seemed aware, without me saying it, that I didn't want to talk about my mother. He taught me to play crib instead of trying to get me to talk about her. He seemed to understand that these were the only times I was still an orphan and that I preferred it that way. He knew I liked medicine, liked the feel of it on my hands and in my wrists. By the lamplight, he showed me how to set bones, how to cauterize a wound, how to tie a tourniquet. I was especially mindful to conflict. You know, the main conflict that's brewing in the first chapter of this book is that the main character's estranged mother has arrived and the protagonist doesn't want a relationship with her. And so I was especially mindful, even in the narrative summary, to be conveying and paying attention to the internal conflict. Lines like, he seemed to understand that these were the only times I was still an orphan and that I preferred it that way. That's some very messy, weird internal conflict and psychology for the character. Narrative summary is a really great place to do interesting psychology work. This isn't even a particularly psychologically dense passage. What this passage is really doing is showing a pattern of things. Many nights I stayed at the farmhouse and then we get an explanation of what those many nights, all of them are kind of the same, look like. And that's a very common use of narrative summary, is to show habit. I picked out this other excerpt as well. Eileen thought Teresa held the role of my mother and there was room for only one and it was a crown she could usurp even though she'd previously rejected it. She brought me gifts as if small peace offerings were all it would take for me to forgive her. A game of knuckle bones, the jacks heavy in metal in a linen pouch, a bar of taffy, a pair of silver earrings. I denied each offering. I find these games pointless and childish. I find taffy too sweet. I don't have my ears pierced. I left the gifts on Freya's pillow, the cleanest rejection I could think of. She also openly commented on how unfair it was that Teresa expected me, a child, to do so much housework while she did nothing to help and I mostly worked to avoid her. She was concerned for my social life, my joint health, my ability to grow and flourish as a young girl should. I needed hobbies. Did I like to read? I should borrow one of Freya's books. I needed friends. Wasn't I interested in boys yet? Come on, Sybil. There aren't any boys in your class, you fancy? You can tell me. Don't be shy. I continued to chop wood and scrub pots and tend the garden and feed Teresa's chickens and preserve my herbs along with the summer burst of wild fruit and help Silas around the ranch because it had to be done, but mostly because I liked it. The tactility of Earth. So there were a few reasons why I picked this passage. Once again, we're getting something habitual. So there's a pattern of Aline trying to give the narrator gifts and she keeps rejecting them. But it's actually non-linear because we're getting a list of all the gifts she got. And then there's some dialogue, which I also wanted to show because you can use dialogue in narrative summary. And so here we have a list of gifts that she's given. And then we have a list of things she says to reject those gifts. And then in the second paragraph, I really wanted to note, first of all, the indirect dialogue. So we have summarized dialogue in the first sentence. She openly commented on how, so this is description of dialogue, but it's indirect. We're not actually seeing the line, the direct line in quotes. And then later we kind of get this indirect use of dialogue where I thought it was quite rich in tone, where the main character is kind of summarizing, retelling things her mother has said 
kind of mocking her, right? Um, I needed hobbies. Did I like to read? I should borrow one of Freya's books. That's not set aside in quotes because it's not a direct line of dialogue. I mean, if it was, it would be, did you like to read? You should borrow one of Freya's books. But she's taking the dialogue and putting it in her own words in order to, to mock it, to make fun of it. And the other thing I really wanted to note in this passage I thought was the rhythm. And I think it's especially important because if you use really repetitive sentence structure and the language is kind of dry, the narrative summary won't feel interesting. You can compensate for the lack of external movement by creating linguistic movements, you know. In that second paragraph, I thought it was a good example of, you know, the first part being kind of rich in tone, which I think is engaging, and then it gets into this long run-on sentence. I continue to chop wood and scrub pots and tend the garden and feed trees and things, etc. Very long sentence, ending that with just a sentence fragment, the, tac the tactility of earth. I thought that that was a good example to illustrate how the rhythm of the language can be used to create motion when you don't have external motion happening the way you would in a scene. I will leave below my Google Doc on scene and summary and all of the tools and tips that I talked about in these two videos. So that's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye!